We join with the crowd that eagerly awaited the coming of Jesus. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Fulfilling prophecy, Jesus entered the city riding humbly on a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus' followers were excited, filled with anticipation. Yet within a few short days, they were scattered disillusioned and frightened, unwilling to follow as far as Christ would have them go. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. We too long to join the triumphal procession, only to find ourselves burdened by the past, fearful of the future, reluctant to accept the way of the cross. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Yet this Palm Sunday, we receive palm branches, a reminder of the welcome offered to Jesus as he traveled toward the cross. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Like the crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, we lay down our palm branches and prepare the way for Jesus, shouting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. During this time of Lenten preparation, we think of those who turned away from the light of Jesus, and we remember that we too turn away. Peter was the one Jesus entrusted to build his church. He was so willing to step out in faith, but he was also the one who denied Jesus. We too deny Jesus. We fail to follow his example. We withdraw from service. And in the face of social pressure, we are a floundering witness to his love for us. Today, we extinguish the sixth Lenten candle with the confession that we have allowed the shadows in our own lives to eclipse the light of Christ.
The Gospel reading is Luke's account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Well, it's Palm Sunday, and spring begins today. Trees are budding, flowers are blooming, even if it is a little chilly out there right now. And it's just a week until Easter. We're nearing the end of a long, dark journey through Lent. You can just feel the excitement in the air as we process into the sanctuary today, waving our palm branches to refrains of Hosanna. It's something people have been doing a long time, God's people. Even a thousand years before Jesus made his way from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, Our spiritual ancestors in Israel made their way into worship with psalms of praise. These psalms of ascent, like Psalm 18 that we heard earlier, were written for the purpose of processing up the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as they made their way to the altar of God. There was excitement in the air on that first Palm Sunday, as Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. Now, ironically, Luke's account that we read this year has no palm branches, no hosannas. Two of the most familiar details of the story in the other three Gospels. It's kind of hard to imagine Palm Sunday without them, isn't it? And so we don't. We conflate the stories from all of the Gospels, just as we do at Christmas. But in Luke, instead of laying down palm branches, there are only cloaks laid out. We weren't going to ask you to lay your coats on the, on the floor today. And instead of the crowd shouting, Hosanna, Praises come from a multitude of Jesus' own disciples, not just the twelve, who have been following him. Luke says that this is not the crowd that would later call for his crucifixion. On this day, they give voice to their deepest longings, that Jesus is their hope for deliverance from oppression. This is significant. Matthew, Mark, and John have the crowds shout Hosanna, meaning save us, which could be quite threatening to the political and religious establishment. But Luke's account bodes far worse for Jesus and gets the attention of Rome's governor Pilate and the high priest Caiaphas as the disciples following Jesus shout Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if the people acknowledge Jesus as their king, 
It means they give their allegiance to the kingdom of God, not to King Herod or Emperor Augustus. It upends the whole political status quo. And they continue, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. To refer to Jesus as king would be bad enough. But this talk of peace would threaten the Roman Empire, whose practice is to achieve peace through military victory. And in the Roman worldview, there was only one way to peace, their way. In a book called The Last Week, theologians Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan describe this procession by the King of Peace into one end of Jerusalem, while at the same time, Pontius Pilate, representing the Roman Empire, enters at the other end of the city with a great show of military force. Pilate has arrived to keep peace during the festival of Passover, when the population of Jerusalem could easily quadruple and the crowds could get a little unruly. He rides in on a magnificent war horse in a display of power intended to intimidate and frighten the people. On the other hand, Jesus, with an entirely different kind of power, and in a mocking parody of the governor, makes his entrance on a humble donkey. This is the king of peace. Now all this made the Pharisees very nervous. And they tried to get Jesus to order his followers to stop, afraid that the wrath of Rome would come down on all of them. But Jesus reminds them that all of creation longs to participate in this great drama. That even if he could get his followers to hush, the stones would shout the good news. Fred Craddock, in his Luke commentary, explains, just as stars can guide, lions and lambs can lie down together, and in a few days the earth can quake and the sun can go out at the worst moment, so can stones shout out. Ironically, this will be the last appearance of the Pharisees before they disappear off the stage of the drama that is about to unfold. Now next Sunday, there will be another parade of sorts as we march in sporting our Easter finery, maybe some of us wearing Easter bonnets. But that parade will be much less meaningful if we don't pay attention to what happens between the parades. Today, we begin Holy Week, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter, the week between those two parades, when we focus on the events that unfolded during that fateful week. Betrayal, suffering, abandonment, and death. Holy Week comes at the end of Lent, a season of reorienting our lives, a season of choosing between the things of this world and the things of God. It's been a time of looking inward and asking this, ourselves the difficult question of whether we're ready to follow Jesus, not just today in this happy procession, but through the rest of this week, indeed all the way to the cross. This morning we stand on the threshold of the week when Christians around the world reflect on that momentous week in Jesus' life on which our very faith hangs. 
Donald Hagner, writing in the Word Biblical Commentary, calls, commentary, calls it a prelude to the Passion. Now, Holy Week may be unfamiliar to some of you. As Protestants, we came to it rather late. The observance of Holy Week goes back to the 3rd or 4th century, when the Christians, along with pilgrims who came to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover, would gather in the places where events took place in that week before Jesus' death and resurrection. The gate where Jesus entered the city, the upper room where he shared the Last Supper with his companions, the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, the hill called Golgotha where he died, the tomb where he was buried, And they began to reenact those events in dramas called passion plays. Today, the church spends this week in contemplation and reflection as we remember those events, symbolically walking through this week, not as Jesus, but with Jesus as one of his followers, trying to experience what he might have felt. So what happens next? It's a whole week until Easter, a difficult and eventful week. Do we skip all the drama and come next Sunday morning singing, Jesus Christ is risen today? How can we possibly proclaim he is risen when we haven't experienced his death? It is the journey from Palm Sunday to Easter, the struggles we share with Jesus on the way to the cross that help us to understand his suffering and death. If we skip from Palm Sunday to Easter, we miss the events that make Easter meaningful we leave out the cross. Yes, looking through our post-resurrection lenses, we know how the story ends. As Paul Harvey says, we know the rest of the story. But we will miss the solemnity of gathering for the Last Supper, hearing the commandment to love one another, and feeling the, the sense of foreboding as the last Lenten candle goes out on Maundy Thursday. We will miss the drama as we participate in the story on Good Friday and the need for solitude and silence to contemplate the meaning of it all. Truly, it was a holy week because Jesus embodied God's message of mercy and salvation giving his life for something that would endure forever. Jesus talked about turning the other cheek, blessing those who persecute you, being reviled and having all kinds of evil uttered against you. And he did not merely preach about it. He lived it during Holy Week. For Christians, this is the most important week of the year. We are all invited to participate in the life-changing drama. For us, the real meaning of Palm Sunday is the entry of Jesus not just into Jerusalem, but into our world as well. So on this Palm Sunday, as we sing our hosannas and lay down our palms to make way for Jesus in our lives, we can trust the unknown future to the God who is always there, making every week of our lives holy. And we can be assured that this week, as we stumble toward Jerusalem, we can rely on God's grace to carry us just as it does in every time of trial in our lives. 
So in this Holy Week, may we understand what Jesus means to our fragmented world and strive to live holy lives. May this be a Holy Week for those of us who would be his followers in our day. And as we bring our 40 days of change to a close, may the greatest change take place in us. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, we thank you for your steady presence in these waning days of Lent. Empower us to live holy lives and be the unseen companion on our journey as we walk with Jesus through this holy week. Amen.